you enjoyed your lunch. The dessert is amazing. It was really hard to pull myself away from the plate to come up here, I have to admit. Um, right now, I would like to welcome Joanne Monfrady Dunn to say a few words and to introduce uh, Bruce. Joanne, I'm sure you all know her well, but just in case, for those of you who are new, Joanne is founder, president, and CEO of today's sponsor, Alliance, one of the industry's leading providers of syndicated and custom digital audiences. Joanne is the architect of Alliance's vision to deliver innovative audience solutions powered by aggregated purchase transactions of multiple direct-to-consumer uh, marketers. A lifetime marketer, Joanne's career includes positions at Time Life, the Norman Rockwell Museum, and Mal Dunn Associates. She is a committed advocate for the development and comprehensive data governance and security standards and has, has a long in, uh, history of service. Joanne is former chairman of the board of the, director, the Direct Marketing Association from 2013 to 2015 and a former chair of the DMA's ethics policy. She's a past president of our own DMCMY and a recipient of DMCMY's Silver Apple Awards, no surprise there. Um, she holds a BA in communications from West Virginia's West Liberty University and was recently admitted to WLU's Alumni Wall of Honor. Welcome, Joanne. by design, and we continue to build on, on, on that capability at Alliant uh, for us, but most importantly for all of um, our clients who uh, participate in our data hub. Um, we've all been really lucky, throw that back, blessed, that we have had decades before probably any of us were born, this industry was self-regulated. And we had great guidelines, and we were able to protect consumer privacy in a thoughtful way, in a self-regulated way. Well, starting January 1, that all changed, right? Uh, with the California Consumer Privacy Act, in effect, January 1, our businesses are now government regulated. One state, and there'll be lots more. So I'm proud and I sleep better because Alliant is fully compliant with CCPA and in everything we do nationwide. And we are also supporting the, um, the national effort to get a federal law because wouldn't it be better, wouldn't it be way more fun to have one law on <laughs> privacy and security versus 50? Because I think that's ridiculous. And if I was a, you know, a marketer, that, that would just be, it's gonna be impossible. So we all have to get behind uh, uh, the national um, effort to get a federal law in place. So consumer privacy, top of the list, obviously for, for us. 
Uh, and additionally, we continue to work on our identity graph because as cookies are phased out, so thankful Alliance Database is PII based because we'll be able to support the, the transition away from cookies. Addressable TV is very exciting. We got a good foothold in 2019 and we're going to be rolling out that, that part of our business in, in, in 2020. There's like a third of my team here, no, maybe 20% of the team. Uh, and if you want to know more about what we're doing at Addressable, addressable TV and digital, uh, lots of people here to talk to. Um, and finally, um, we're excited about this omni-channel shift where uh, direct consumer retailers are looking for more channels. And we all have channels that can help them. So that might help the direct mail bump up a little bit. Anyway, so there's lots more exciting things going on and we're gonna hear all these things from our speaker um, and who needs no introduction. And, and Bruce, I'm sorry, I didn't do nearly as detailed an introduction as you as Ginger did Bruce, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but for 30 years, Bruce has been working with a myriad of different types of companies in our space, building businesses bottom up, and really helping, helping companies like Alliant, and as well as big enterprise companies, be smart about how they grow their businesses. He leads the Winterberry Group's uh, practice as managing director. Uh, he, is responsible for their, their, their consulting practice as well as setting strategy and operating um, agenda. Um, Winterberry serves marketers, marketing companies, agencies, data providers, service providers, digital marketing agencies, a, a real multi-channel play and, and, and has great expertise across those channels. Um, as you know, Bruce has had significant industry involvement uh, as a as speaker. I don't know how many times, probably 20 times a year you're on the road, at least. Uh, and this is where he kicks it off right here with us, and we're thrilled to have him here. He also speaks at Ad Week and, uh, and Ramp Up and, and lots more. <clears throat> Past DMA board member, current Marketing Edge board member, right? Yep. yep. Um, Trustee. Pardon me? Trustee, right? Trustee, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Oh, trustee. That's not us. I like that. That kind of kicks it up a notch. I like that. So today we're going to hear Bruce's outlook for 2020 and a little recap from 2019. So please join me in, in thanking and welcoming Bruce. So if you're wondering, this is my glass of wine. Um, as always, it's a privilege and a pleasure, and thank you again, Joanne, for sponsoring for 13 years. Thank you all for having us here. Um, I want to thank two people specifically in this room, Hilary Edelstein and Joshua Kovar, from my team at Winterberry. Making this presentation, it seems like, okay, you got 39 slides or whatever. The amount of work that goes into identifying those trends, looking at the numbers, checking the numbers, deciding those numbers suck and you'd like to do some other numbers, you know, is a really painful process that starts at the beginning of the year. It kind of forces us to get our thoughts together for the year. As we go out and we serve, whether it's the suppliers, the data companies, the agencies, etc., as we work with private equity funds who are investing in the sector, as we work with the brands, you know, the questions are, are, are always the same. What's happening? What should we do? So hopefully this will give you a little clue into our thinking and how it works. Um, so Senior Managing Partner at Winterberry Group, we are now 18 years old, 13 years sitting in front of this audience. <laughs> so it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm gonna do a quick look back at 2019 because it's always good to understand what happened the year before. Um, slow, steady economic growth for those people who track these things. You know, as the economy goes, ad spend goes. So what were the drivers? Consumer spending helped to drive GDP growth last year. Unemployment, historic lows. Corporate profits, flat. We've, so that's something we're paying close attention to. They were down about 3%. We're forecast down another 2% this year. As those things tighten, they say, I need to get more out of my marketing. The more money I'm spending on marketing, the better return I need to get. It also drives other things like mergers and acquisitions. So we watched those. We had a year where we talked about impeachment, at least the government 
Start off the year shut down, ended with impeachment. They're dysfunctional in Washington, it is what it is. Um, tariffs were a big part of the story, freaking people out. Now they're stabilizing again, but they're still. 25% tariffs on single malt scotch is a bad thing. <laughs> that is definitely a bad thing for me, for Mr. Fergley. It's not a good thing. And in the media world, the story was really about control and privacy. You know, who's going to control their data? What about privacy? It moved from a backstory to a front story, and, it, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. But all in all, it was kind of a slow, steady year. We got, so the way we calculate the industry, I'm going to break some of these glasses. Um, the way we calculate the industry, you know, is we do a bottom up, we had about 2.7% growth. Normally, ad spend growth doubles GDP. So if GDP was 2.3 and we only got 2.7, it's actually not very good growth. So something had to be happen, happening underneath those numbers. So some channels did you do as well. This is mail volumes. We went into the year fairly optimistic that mail was going to kind of hold on. But as the year went by, it started to decline, and that decline accelerated. And 7.4% is probably the biggest decline we've seen since the correction of 2008-2009. So, so it was a fairly strong drop-off, and, and a mixed one at best. We think a lot of it's coming out of retention mail. It's just that, that shift to email, that shift to other direct messaging is really pulling mail down. But there's still good acquisition and good volumes. The rest of offline, a mixed story. Overall, down about 5.9%. Big drivers, email, sorry, direct mail down, magazine. Magazine and, and newspaper are just always down. So I just no matter what year I get up here, those numbers are down. We are. They started to decline in 2006. So just about as long as I've been doing this, it's been going down. Linear TV took a pretty big hit, but addressable TV, which is addressable linear, so which is different than digital video, actually grew pretty well last year. So we're starting to see that creep up, and it is definitely taking some money out of linear, but overall, the linear TV budgets are starting to shift. And it was kind of sitting around that 68 to 70 billion for the better part of the last five years. The other part is there were no catalysts. You know, you didn't have Olympics, you didn't have an election. So there weren't a lot of drivers to, to move that forward. Outdoor and experiential are two areas we're watching. Did, whether it's digital outdoor, but all sorts of experiences, and the money is following the shift in trend. So we're watching those numbers pretty closely. Of course, on the digital side, life was pretty green. And money continued to shift in. So the new money that came in and money that was shifting out of offline, this is where it's showing up. So every single category, as usual, was green. But some of it was up pretty significantly, whether it was search, display, paid social, really grew strongly. And new categories like influencer, which was up 70% year over year. We were looking at some of the quarter over quarter numbers in Influencer. You know, we were talking you know, a market that was going up 80, 90% quarter over quarter. So we're watching the market pretty closely, but that steady shift continues. The other thing that we are seeing is data and data, data services spend. So data and data services up 5%, driven by digital media on the one side, pulled down by offline data on the other, TV data and analytics is going to follow what happens in TV, but email database and, and hygiene, when you start thinking about the impact of CCPA and, and knowing your customer and having that first party data relationship, it's going to go and show up in the email numbers. So we're watching the data numbers over there, but overall it was a pretty good year in the data industry and our channel checks talking to our clients and talking to our partners, you know, those that were Overly dependent on direct mail, some did well and some did not. Those that were digital, pretty much all did well. So when you look at that blended number, that's what's pulling you forward. If you, if you don't have a blend in your model, it's probably gonna create some challenges for you. Um, we released a white paper yesterday with the IAB called the Data Centric Org. This is the third time that we've done that. We asked them, to what extent is your brand 
data center today. Are we making progress year over year? Well, there's slightly more data centric. You keep thinking like there's gonna be this massive breakthrough, this big transformation. It's a slow incremental change, but there's slight change in the positive direction. That being said, they're very focused because you know, you go from data is a nice to have to if I mishandle my data, I'm likely to get penalized because of CCPA. A lot of focus on getting much more data centric, but really having those strategies in place to govern data. So again, a lot of focus is being applied to this, but they're not successful. So you kind of wonder why with all this attention, all this focus, all this will to make a change, what's holding things back? Why is it strategy? Is it people? Is it the platforms? Is it legacy? Is it brand silos? Or is it E, all of the above? It's kind of an all of the above question. Um, but I think this year, we start to see some step level change because when it's a nice to have, yeah, I should do this, but I have 10 other priorities versus your chief legal officer, your general counsel saying to you, what are you doing about this? Your priorities change. And oh, I don't know if I can take this out of my working media budget. It doesn't matter, there's now a corporate budget that is contributing to, to solving for some of this. In the world of M&A last year, it was another good big up year. Marketing technology, digital media commerce, tons of deals. So every time Scott Brinker releases another chief MarTech slide with 7,000 companies or 8,000 companies, et cetera, we are seeing a phenomenal rate of consolidation on the other side and a huge wave of investment with hundreds of billions of dollars of private capital raised coming the other way to start new entities. So we're not seeing a shrinkage in the companies, but we're seeing a lot of marketing tech deals. And we are also seeing growth in the agency deal. So this is our global agency transaction number, and it's still heavily strategic. It's not so much financial buyers. It is the whole coast, but their whole coast, you know, are not just buying digital. There was a good five years of doing this where all they bought were digital things. Now they're going back and saying, wait, it's not all digital. Maybe we're in an omnichannel world and we should be thinking more on the channel. So only a third of their deals were digital in nature and there was a lot of everything else. But overall, the transactions and the number of transactions in that space, when you get slow growth, okay, so, so the economy is not growing a lot, you're trying to take share. You can either take share or you can buy someone to make your numbers. We are definitely seeing a let's buy someone, the money's cheap, and go buy that revenue growth and buy some of that profit growth on the bottom line to stimulate the value of our business. So we are absolutely seeing that. All right, so that's kind of 2019, real short, real sweet. Pam said, no more than five minutes. It's last year, let's talk about this year. So what do we think about this year? So I think the very first thing is we are now in an experience economy. We have really shifted and transformed. Consumer preferences have shifted 6.3% growth in spending experiences. This is across the economy. That is a really big number. Social sharing of experiences with family and friends. So, so how you approach an experience is not just about me. It's now, I wanna share this. I wanna make it part of my life. I wanna show it in my social world because points, dollars, etc., are not enough for me anymore. Um, when they think about the brands that they're gonna share experiences with, there are a couple of things that they're really thinking about. They're thinking about, do I trust that brand? You know, why do I trust that brand? What has the brand done to create that trust? It Does it align with my values? So they're looking for the reliability on that brand. They're looking for the relevance, but they're really looking for credibility. It's not enough to just go spend money and, and greenwash things and say good things, but you have to do that to build that. So what happens on the other side? If I'm worried about how do I deliver an experience instead of points and dollars or whatever to, from my brand, I have to think about experiential marketing. So why is experiential marketing going up? Because people have shifted to this experience economy. And it's across digital and physical. 
So while you saw shopper marketing numbers declining fairly rapidly, that's because the print component is coming out, but that physical and digital experience, that, that video experience, those going to events, the application, all of those things is where that new focus on. If I'm gonna deliver experience, I need to be able to recognize you. So I'm the channel recognition. Despite regulation, privacy, et cetera, it's I need to know who I am targeting. I need to know who I'm delivering. I need to know that you got that experience. And did you take advantage of it? If I sent you tickets to something, did you go? So how do I track back? How do I do that attribution? And I need that personalization because I need to make it about you or maybe about you and your family and your friends. The other part, you know, as I said before, the brand trust delivery, we're seeing a lot of focus on internal training at brands. This is not just, okay, I need to deliver that experience. It's that experience you have with the brand when it comes in, that customer training, that customer experience of all of the employees on the front line, whether it's at a hotel, whether it's at a theme park, whether it's in the bank branch. That money, that focus on how do I teach them how to deliver that experience and to generate trust, there's a lot of money flowing in that direction. Digital cost, the consulting piece, forget execution, consulting dollars that are going into this in the US, $5 billion a year. So there's a lot of money flowing in this direction, which if you happen to be a management consultant, it's a good thing. All right, so the second trend is mobility. This portability, so if I, I have these experiences, how do I take them with me? How do I move them from place to place? So I need to move this across connected devices. I have 26.7 billion connected devices. I have 20 plus devices per person. So when you start to think about my car is connected, my phone is connected, my activity, my thermostats, my home, all of these things are being connected. How do I deliver this consistently? How do I start to create experiences that are connected? It's great that I bought a plane ticket. I want not just some hotel advertisement, but show me how you track me and how you can support me across that entire trip experience. The car, the hotel, the things to do, the events, the things that are available. So I want all of this to be connected. I want mobile ticketing. I don't want pieces of paper. I went to Cirque du Soleil on Saturday night and nobody had paper. Like everybody just held out their phone. The other side of that is event amplification. If only so many can, people can have that experience, go to that event, how do I create that in a broader environment? I start to amplify that. I start to stream those events out to people. I start to make that interactive. We're seeing a lot more of that. So this mobility, this connectedness. Well, what does that mean from a marketer perspective? Data integration and identity. I still need to solve for that. And we're still, with all of the investment, it's still pretty early location and, and extension and location data. As much as it's maybe the most threatened category, at the same time, it's the third most popular category of data right now. So the data I need is I need to understand where you are so that I can give you the right experience at the right time. The other part, if we are seeing a lot of this in, in the agency world, is investing in digital design, digital development, customer experience development, because these apps, these experiences in the digital world don't just pop out. I need designers, I need creative, I need programmers, I need back-end dev. So all of these roles have to come together, so we're seeing a big focus and a big discussion of should we do this inside or should we do this outside? or in-house or outsource. Next trend, influence. Reviews, recommendations, and influencers. Influencer obviously made it to our, our tracking this year for the first time. 93% of consumers say that online reviews impact purchasing decisions. Those numbers go way up when you are looking at Gen Z and you are looking at millennials. The numbers I saw this week, 25, they will spend 25 minutes on average researching a product or experience before they execute. That goes down as you get older, but even in, you know, when we look at it over time, the amount of time people are spending reading product reviews, looking for validated, trusted reviews, keeps going up. So what do they do? They follow celebrities. 
because those are the people to trust. Yes. 20%, it was like an amazing stat. 20% of global internet users follow celebrities. And those celebrities, many of them have become influencers. But when it really comes down to it, they trust their family and friends. So the reviews that you see from your families and friends are the trusted reviews. Then you think about you know, those next tier, the employees, the online reviews, the influencers, et cetera. And 15% of influencers who sign up to publish never actually do anything. There's a whole lot of scamming going on in this world. This is, so for those who remember the beginnings of affiliate marketing, this is very much like affiliate marketing, where all of a sudden everybody could be an affiliate, everybody played, everybody took some money off, and nobody was really tracking whether it worked or didn't work. The networks started to, to consolidate, they started to weed out, you went from 50,000 affiliates down to 3,000 affiliates, back up to seven or 8,000. I think influencer marketing and affiliate marketing are very, very related. It's just a slightly different angle at the same approach, but we have the same urgency around how to monitor trust and, and to validate whether or not these are good reviews, good numbers, the right influence. I think the market will get there, but in the meantime, people just throw money at it. So we're seeing this, this rapid growth. But we think that as we get into 2021, you really start to see much better control over what does that influencer network look like and what talent should I trust? Who's just a shell? So, so it's something that we're watching pretty closely because A, the money's going in that direction, and B, like almost everything else, it's got challenges with fraud and waste. Direct disruption, so buying direct, direct to consumer brands, lots of like conversation about how it's disrupting everything. The reality of it is, it is growing four times faster than the rest of retail. So some of us who spent a lot of time looking at retail numbers, Hillary, um, came back and said, there's a reason why DTC brands matter a lot and they behave differently. If you were here 20 years ago, you were like, wait, these are catalogs. They were direct to consumer brands, weren't they? And then they became multi-channel. And now they're digital first brands. So the, so the money that is pouring in from the investment community to create these brands and to exit these brands to companies like Amazon and Walmart, et cetera, just continues to flow through. And they're looking at how do I disintermediate those, those channels? So if I was going indirect through a big box distributor, and now I have to establish that direct-to-consumer relationship. And if I was an intermediary, should I be creating my own products? Think about Amazon. They are both an intermediary and a channel and keep disrupting the market by taking products, whether they're consumer electronic products, or, and saying, oh look, we're watching how this person or this company is marketing. This product's taking off, we can make that product cheaper. And we've actually learned a lot of those lessons. So there's this constant disintermediation in the D2C market. The other thing is delivery as a competitive advantage has become a thing. How fast can I get it to you? Do you want it today, tomorrow? Should you sign up and get a subscription so that delivery will be free and fast and by drone? So, so as you go through, and if you think about the pain that FedEx is going through, as Amazon has got its own logistics in place. You know, this is, this is real transformation of society as you get to, it's not just buy direct, but I want it now. And so we're watching these, the delivery competition and how quickly you get it and what you get it and how secure it is and new products and new services coming up there. But we're also seeing this, these subscription because delivery and return has gotten a lot easier, subscription models, rent the runway, you know, being able, you can subscribe to almost anything, it feels like, but apparel is becoming a big deal. Not so much for guys. It's much more skewed to female than it is to male, but nonetheless, these, these wash, rinse, repeat models, as opposed to buying it and keeping it, it's more cost effective. If you're only gonna wear it twice anyway, why own it? Um, some real headwinds and challenges. Five years ago, if you were buying on social, which is a primary channel, channel social was fairly reasonably priced. Over the, as, as social visitor growth 
and that time spent has flattened and the number of new subscribers to social platforms has stabilized, all of a sudden CPMs start going up. There's a lot more money chasing the same audience and what was cost effective as an emerging D2C brand is not cost effective anymore. So this whole digital first thing is challenged because my return on investment is not where it was. So it's harder to become the next big unicorn. You have to spend a lot more money than you did before. So we're watching that. The other problem is, for all it's worth, digital channels don't scale. Almost all the DTC brands, they get to a certain part, they've done display, they've done search, they've built up their email lists. And what do they do next? <coughs> TV. They are right back to TV. So one of the things that's, that's holding the TV market is the fact that as these brands mature, they must go to that channel. And some of them even go to direct mail. So we've seen a, a large number, the DoorDashes, et cetera, have shifted back to mail. So, so channels don't die. <laughs> they just come back to life in a different way. You know, we look at buy online, pick up in store. We look at buy online, return in store. All of these models of delivery, transaction, et cetera, are changing the industry. But it also means it's a lot of work on the front end and the back end from a technology standpoint. To get this to work well is not actually that easy. And then finally, the last part that we're watching here is real-time data integration for product customization. I come in, I want a shoe that's built for me, or I want a shirt that is designed for me. So we're starting to see this product customization. That requires real-time data so that I can get all that sizing information. It can go back to the factory. It can, you know, that, that level of personalization, fully consented personalization to get that experience of, I had a shoe built for me, just like I might have gone you know, to, to a tailor in, in the UK once upon a time. Another application for data, another challenge in how do I move this and get it right? Because if you get it wrong and you get two left shoes, that kind of sucks. <laughs> Video. Video is the story of the year in terms of money shifting in. Um, 25 billion spent in 2020. Those numbers just keep going up. All of the streaming wars, the new subscriptions that are coming out, the Disney Pluses, the Hulus, you know, we are seeing transformation. Some of it is not showing up necessarily in ad numbers, though they are getting big, because it's also showing up in subscription numbers. People are not watching less. As a matter of fact, that time spent with video went from 79 to 103 minutes over the last couple of years. So we're watching more, we're consuming it differently, we're consuming it across devices, we're consuming it on social platforms. But what I've really started to know is I'm consuming it by app. I don't think about, and, and I'm having moved from New York to Miami, I can never remember what the channels are anymore, but I know that I'm looking for, looking for HBO or I'm looking so we are this, this channel paradigm, and back in the 90s, I worked with some folks who were great UI people, great product innovators, and it was all about how do we make this digital world function like channels on TV? Guess what? I think we're on the other side of this. I think we are now going to see how do I get the TV world, that channel world, to function like the digital world of applications. And, and I believe 2020, in 2020, this is the tipping point on that stuff. I will have a bundle of subscriptions. I will go in from an app. Those apps don't necessarily have channels, they have categories. So we are moving around, we are changing the paradigm of TV. But it's, you know, one thing we can count on, there's more video than ever before. Loyalty, there are changes going on in the loyalty field as well. So 73% of consumers will recommend a brand with a good loyalty program. 70% of loyalty is up for grabs. So are we more loyal than we were before? Is, you know, what is changing? The, the, the changing goes back to the conversation about brand trust. Do I trust this brand? Do they give me a good experience? And will that create the loyalty? Is it more than points and miles? Um, I look and it's like, I spent a lot of money flying around. If I don't get a certain status, I will find another airline who will take care of me. It's that easy, doesn't matter how many years I've been doing it, but if I was not getting that next year, 
I'm off to the next place. They will take loyalty back faster. So everybody wants it if it's good. It's up for grabs. They're just as willing to retract. Does that make them more loyal or less loyal? But again, even in the loyalty space, this whole notion of subscriptions. If I'm on wine.com, sorry. If I'm on wine.com for $49, I get free shipping. And instead of having to go hunt around at the liquor store and figure out, do they have this? Is this in? I just go online. I look. They deliver it to my building. I'm done. And there's free shipping. And so my life keeps getting easier because of the direct consumer relationships. And this will make me more loyal to wine.com or Total Wine or whatever. So, so we're watching loyalty shift. And we're watching brands really start to recalculate if, if it's so easy for people to shift, what does it really cost? How much should I spend to keep these people? We know it costs a lot more to acquire new than it is to, to retain. But if we're not really retaining them, what, where is that balance? How should that spend work and what channels should I use? And those own channels, the email, web, and in-store, where I have the most control, that's where I'm gonna put a lot of my effort, and a lot of my juice, and a lot of my money. We're also looking at that whole customer experience shift, whether it's shift, whether it's shipping, whether it's VIP experiences, so that becomes increasingly more important. And again, channel management and employee engagement. If we don't get our employees engaged, this doesn't work. And these are all big focal points within that loyalty industry. Oh yeah, I had to get to privacy. It had to become part of the conversation. 30% said they're compliant, another said 19% said they will be compliant by the end of the year. No, it's just we don't really believe it. What is pretty interesting is because all of the press and conversation in that hierarchy of needs, starting with like food, fire, and shelter, and stuff like that, personal information and the concern about it went from 13th to 7th in the last couple of years. This is now a top of mind. It has made the top 10 of things people are constantly concerned about. That's why privacy matters. You know, it's not just about CCPA, it's about all the other states. You know, it's Google saying, you know what, we're gonna kill off cookies. Apple, we're not gonna give you the IDs you need. Facebook, who knows, you know, but really pulling back on the tracking. Are they pulling back on the tracking or are they pulling back and giving you the data? Because they certainly still have the data. You just can't use it for attribution anymore. You can't use it, you know, they're going to make it more challenging in the name of privacy. But, you know, a couple of things we're really seeing is Brands that didn't do it before have to manage their data across silos. Consent management platforms that allow you, if somebody says, I want to opt out, or I want to know what you have on me, this is not optional anymore. This is actually a big deal, and you need to train your employees, so you have to find your data. Always the first challenge of any data audit has been, where did you put it? I know it's in here somewhere, and it's not just the marketing data, it's all kinds of data that I have to go pull back together. And then once I've pulled it together, I need a consent management platform. Consent management platforms have raised over three quarters of a billion dollars in the last nine months. There is so much money going into software. That's great. Now, how do I know it's you? How do I validate that it's really you? That is problem number two. So I've got to find it. I've got to have a platform so I can actually report back on it. And I need to make sure, because you know what's worse than not having a platform and a policy? giving my data to someone else. They're like, tell me everything about Bruce Beagle. You really Bruce Beagle? Sure I am. That's a bad thing. That will create absolute havoc. So this is not an easy problem to solve. And there's, there's certainly a ton of money going in the technology part of this. But technology firms are great at software. It doesn't mean they actually can help you find your data or service this. So there's a big opportunity and a big challenge. Our survey on data-centric org, 80% of companies are not well prepared. That's the net. So 50% we're gonna be ready. We finished our survey in November, so we don't believe it. So in the beginning, we had GDPR, and it shined the light on the darkness of data, and it was good. <laughs> and from the West Coast came CCPA, where it was written that after six months, the offenders will be punished. 
and it will be bad, but it will be terrible. And on the seventh day of the seventh month, when regulation has kicked in, thou shalt not rest, there shall be federal regulation. Not a chance. But it sounded really good when I was writing it. So we don't know, and we certainly don't think we're going to get any regulation this year. We don't think people are going to be ready. We've spent a week, a month in Europe for the last nine or 10 months. They're still not all ready for GDPR 18 months after regulation went into effect. It's not easy, it's not hard. Obviously the big brands, the enterprises have made the investment, but there's a big middle that's, go, that's making bets on, well, maybe this, won't, they won't get to me for a while. It's just for a while. So over the next two years, we will catch, we will catch up but we think that most brands are pretty unprepared at the moment. All right, moving on to data technology and services. Analytics, 80% of CMOs increasing their spending on predictive and prescriptive analytics. The money is flying in. 45% say, ah, you know, I actually don't know if it really works from an attribution standpoint. It may never work, but they keep trying. Um, 280,000 positions were open on LinkedIn when I looked this week for data analysts, data scientists. That is a lot of jobs. So again, this is the job that just keeps giving. If you have that skill set, go and do it. Um, what we're watching on the other side of that in response, analytics practice development. Whether it's in-house at the brand or outsource at the suppliers, people are building those practices now. You know, it, it's, it becomes something that you need to have, again, not a nice to have. And there's $6.7 billion of analytics spent in the US. There's a lot of money being spent to solve for these problems, to make it better, to make it more predictive. 53% um, of those brands said it's weakness. So with all the money going in, people are not satisfied with where they are from an analytics standpoint. We are seeing insights moving up getting a seat at the table. It's not something where, oh yeah, let's do a creative treat and then we'll go get some data to validate that creative. It's, it's really starting to shift inside of our agency clients. So we're watching analytics with a lot of focus. We're watching data. Part of me says data should absolutely be falling through the floor. The other part is 16% said they'd actually reduce it. Data's not falling through the floor. It's shifting how it's applied, the types of data are moving around, the governance, you know, all really important, but with all the anxiety, they're not saying I am moving away from third party data, which is a good thing for the people in this room. Decisioning and AI, so next paper coming out from Winterberry Group is going to be on decisioning. We've looked at the world of paid earned and owed media. We have looked at the number of platforms that are making decisions on a channel by channel basis. Now, go back to our whole experience thing. I need consistent, trusted experiences. I need decision engines that cross channels. So AI promises that they will deliver that. $11 billion of VC and private equity money later, it's getting better, but the amount of data is increasing so fast that applying all of that AI back and making it transparent is the, both the opportunity and the challenge. Everybody says this is going to change the world of marketing. The question is how and when, and how hard is it? The silos inside of the brands. So the very first thing, if I want one unified decision engine that gives me on the same data, gives me consistent messaging across direct mail, addressable TV, email, etc., I need one brain. I have lots and lots of brains and they're all not talking to each other. So even off the same data, they're not linked. Even if I solve this technology problem, I have the silos inside of my corporate organization. My marketers are set, oh, that's the brand group. They make those decisions. And that's the direct group. And this is, or this is paid, earned, and owned. The silos inside the brand are a bigger inhibitor to, to decisioning success because they would have to agree that one platform is right and they would have to lift it up, and that's gotta come from the CMO down. So we think that, that we've got a ways to go. Real-time decisioning, great concept, but if you're in a regulated industry, you need that to be auditable. 
You need to be able to report on it. I can't have black box decisions being made around things like credit. So not only do I need all this great, fast, real-time AI, I need a big, fat audit trail behind it. But again, the solutions are coming. Um, the complexity of making all this work together. So it's one of the reasons we decided, you know, we had done our identity papers and we did our CDP paper. We believe this is the next layer as you kind of go from the data layer up towards those applications that you use across channels. This decisioning layer and, and the orchestration that flows from that, we think this is the next big problem to tackle. The question is how long is it going to take us? Speaking of CDPs, what is the next CDP? So they change it from customer data platform to customer marketing platform to on the chat. You know what? They can call it whatever it is. The, the reality is a billion dollars was spent on CDPs, 3,000 plus systems. If you were to add up all of the marketing databases managed by the Merkels, Epsilons, Axioms, et cetera, it's less than 1,000 after 20 or 30 years. Yet these CDPs have gone out and they've sold 3,000 platforms saying that they're gonna manage data. Then you see a study from some, I think Telium just came out with a study this week that said actually less than half of these are really managing data. They're doing other things even though they're called a customer data platform. So we're really watching the market, but ultimately if I'm going to manage data across channels for one use case and only one called privacy, I need to have an environment that it goes into, and my email platform, which a lot of digital first companies are doing, is not that platform. Okay. And my marketing database is probably going to be that platform, but having some large bespoke platform is too high. And so we see that that growth of CDPs starting to, not only is it expanding, but it's starting to cannibalize some of the spend that is in traditional databases. Because they're lightweight, they're easier to use, but I still have to go find the data. The other problem, there aren't that many providers, suppliers who know how to put it in. So it's great that I can install this, this technology, but who's gonna get the data? How do I get the data clean? So all the hygiene that's associated with it. I, there are enough issues and too few suppliers who can help me make this work. We know it's top of mind. We know it'll probably change its name again, so you can raise more money on a new name because you can't raise money on an old name. Um, but the problem will still have to be a blend of that data, data services, and data technology. One of the other things we're watching right now, creative content and context. $355 billion was spent globally on content. That's a lot of money. It is growing at over 13% a year. So you can't have all these channels proliferating and all this content not proliferating. Making that volume of content, versioning it, personalizing it, is actually really hard. It's actually pretty profitable. We're seeing it done onshore, but it's getting too expensive. We're seeing it done through automation. We're seeing it done nearshore, and we are absolutely seeing this offshore. But this demand for the content, it's great. I have a thousand segments that I can target on. I have three pieces of creative. Great. Why do I need more than three? You know, it's, so, so dynamic creative optimization, the tools are maturing, but they've lagged. So we think that the data side of, of this whole marketing equation has outpaced the creative side, not because creative didn't want to, but just all of a sudden there's a, a realization that creating all of this content, this information, to live in that personalized world is, is really hard. And that many versions are, are really complex to manage and to scale up. The other thing we are seeing is as much as data targeting is under question, contextual targeting, understanding whether it's at page level semantic or it's keyword level is on the rise. And those providers who are part of that contextual, if I take PII data out, what can I use? I can use contextual data. And the, the number of questions we are hearing and the providers in that space are growing. So we're really watching context. Now I need to create this <laughs> content and it needs to be contextually relevant. And it needs to be searchable and findable so that I can do targeting off context. So there's a lot going on and this is a place people are spending money. In housing, 
So having lived through many years of in-housing and, and outsourcing, and there's wave after wave of this, you know, it, it starts in-house, or sorry, it starts out of house. Then you go, I believe I can do this better by bringing it in-house, I can save some money, I can be more efficient. As you go through that, it's a cycle. When the economy's good, you start hiring all these people. The economy's bad, somebody goes, what are all these people doing here? Can't we outsource this? And it cycles back out. So we think it's both cyclical and systemic. You know, so there are parts that are going to be in-house and parts that will be done out of house. So we're really watching the market. We think it's going to be blended. You know, it's not going to be either or. It will depend if it's an emerging channel, the brand's not gonna bring it in. If it's a skill like analytics, some will be in. But people in analytics get bored. <coughs> Big, great creatives, they get bored. Like, retaining these people is not easy. So we're watching in-housing pretty carefully. The agency landscape that's supporting all of this, fragmenting. So we keep, you know, this pie had like six segments, and then it had 10 segments, and then it had 12. You know, it just keeps fragmenting. So the market, the market is changing pretty significantly. You know, this whole digital transformation side of it, how do I make my brand clients better? How do I make it more digital? $50 billion spent globally in 2020. There is a lot of money trying to solve for these problems. So we don't think that the agency model is dead. We think that there's shift. There's changing from retainer to project-based. We're having talent issues, diversity issues. So there's a lot of issues. The model is absolutely not dead. It's just changing and morphing. And finally, for this section, M&A. Low interest rates this year, slow organic growth, stable profit. So what I said at the beginning, it's going to drive more mergers and acquisition activity this year. And we are seeing it right out of the gate. The number of deals, the number of calls that we are getting from private equity to work on transactions, the money is there. The number of people are saying, I need a list of add-ons to my platform. This is not slowing down. And there's nothing that we really see during an election year that's going to get in its way short of some of the big issues. Mm -hmm. Things that we watch for, global, global macroeconomic risk is probably the number one that could pilot, put us on pause. We think overall, this is gonna be a pretty good year. We think that we're gonna go from that 2.7 up to about 7.2, while the economy is sitting at about 1.9% growth. So we're looking at a 3X year, you know, as opposed to the normal 2X. We think we've got good tailwinds. We've got 10 billion of extra money gonna be juiced for the political campaigns. So overall, we think pretty positively about what's gonna happen in marketing this year and then figure out all those trends. So what does this translate to? Offline comes back. So as much as it was down, TV's gonna get a bounce. We've got an Olympics, we've got an election, etc. Newspaper magazine, no surprise, still down. What do you think? Direct mail will stabilize again. So some of that bounce down that we're seeing stabilizes. But overall, you know, for offline to be back in growth mode is a good thing. And when I think about 2021, it's probably gonna be a different story next year. Digital keeps growing. It won't grow at 19% like last year, but we're still looking at a 14.5% up in this sector. Digital audio, digital video, you know, all of the channels still green. It's just slowing a little bit as it, as it continues to grow. And it's harder to take share from growing channels in the offline side. So still growth capturing most of the new money. We think it's, it's worth watching social as much as anything else. Will social slow down or will we keep getting new platforms? And data. We think this year that we're probably gonna see about a 6% up. We're seeing more money going into data database and data services than there is actually new money going into the data side. But the channels are all green and we've got some stabilization. So we're pretty optimistic that 2020 is gonna be a good year in this industry, and that we're gonna get steady growth. It won't be spectacular growth, but these are good numbers and a good outlook for the year. And of course, offline still spent is still bigger than online. 
So we're not quite there, tipped over the edge yet. But boy, each year it's getting closer and closer. All right. Thank you. I have about five minutes if people want to ask questions. I will take some. Bruce, of your 2019 outlook. Can you go back and reconcile what your outlook looked like versus what actually happened? That was the first set of numbers. It was? So 18 over 19 was a reconciliation. We look back because we also have to add new channels and look and see. And then 19 over 20 numbers. So we do go back and reconcile. Because you don't really get the full what happened last year, probably for another three, four months. So there's still pretty much estimates on 19. But our 18 numbers are numbers as far as we can go. Yeah. Um, we talk, first of all, thank you very much. Fantastic presentation. When you talked about experimental sponsorship, does that include things like trade shows and conferences? And do you have any thoughts on that, that kind of spend? So event marketing. Anybody go to CES? Um, anybody go to Adobe's conference, Oracle's conference, sales? So event is still big. What we're seeing, probably the biggest shift that we're seeing is much smaller private events. You can't easily compete with giant events um, as, an, as a small brand. So we're seeing a lot more individual, a lot more dinners, breakfasts, lunches for small groups, 50 people, 60 people, 70 people type of summits um, as a shift away from some of the bigger events. You need to have a fairly broad audience to bring, to bring in enough people like the ANA does, or the IAB does, in order to still hold an event yourself. But people are still getting out, and sponsorship dollars are out there. It's a way to break through the clutter. So donate and sponsor to the DMC. <laughs> like, First, do you, do, you, do you think that uh, your point about the growth of experiential marketing, do you think marketers are, uh, are leaning hard enough into that and i don't just mean the digital experiences i mean the, the offline experiences as they go forward and putting enough emphasis on that and using all the data they have, they can find to do that i think they're shifting money back i absolutely think money is coming in it's not just digital money it's that event money it's those experiences whether it's dinners or, or subscriptions or shipping or whatever anything that they can do to, to find that and build that relationship and build trust. So I think they're really putting money there. Great. But tracking it, still not as yeah, yeah. Anything else? Do you break this out in all by vertical or industry, such as retail versus healthcare? For our clients. <laughs> okay, last question. We're all set. Thank you very, very much. Have a great